Hi, welcome to Audiobook Academy. This is a self-paced audiobook. There's no need to keep an eye on things. Just pay attention. Thank you for taking the time to listen. This is a book summary of Ultra Learning by Scott H. Young. Is it possible to identify some of the obstacles that prevent you from learning a new language or mastering a new skill that you've always wanted to learn? For the majority of us, it is simply a matter of time. Ultra Learning is a comprehensive guide to learning in a short period of time and with depth. Ultra Learning is a more intense version of learning, much like an ultra marathon is a more intense version of a marathon. Both are examples of extreme sports. When it comes to learning new skills and concepts quickly and effectively, Ultra Learning lays out the fundamentals of how to do so. They demonstrate how we can efficiently and effectively learn complex skills, particularly over short periods of time. The book also shows us how to design self-directed learning projects that will help us stay relevant in our field, advance professionally, and master any skill we desire, all while adhering to nine core learning principles. Author Scott Young is a New York Times best-selling author, podcast host, computer programmer, and voracious reader who lives in New York City. As a result of his passion for self-mastery and professional development, he has championed a thirst for knowledge in order to help people live better, more enriched lives. Young has spent years researching and studying ultra-learners, and as a result of his research, he has learned strategies and developed simple principles that can be used to optimize learning for everyone. Young believes that staying ahead of the curve in times of rapid economic and technological change is dependent on a commitment to lifelong learning. If we want to distinguish ourselves from the crowd and rise above mediocrity, we must make a commitment to lifelong learning. However, this presents difficulties because we cannot always learn new skills through the same methods that we use to learn them. Even when we try to master difficult skills in a short period of time, our old routines and problem-solving methods frequently fall short of the mark. Young provides an alternative approach by providing powerful strategies that allow us to break out of our mental ruts and achieve success. By introducing new learning methodologies, we're shown how to push through, retain more information, and achieve greater results. So, if you want to learn a new skill, stay relevant, reinvent yourself, and be able to adapt to whatever the workplace throws at you, it may be time to consider ultra-learning. This briefer summary examines the advantages of ultra-learning, as well as the nine core principles of ultra-learning, as well as the steps involved in developing an ultra-learning project. Understanding the concept of ultra-learning what if we could get an Ivy League education without having to go to a top-tier university or college? What if we were able to learn that language we've been putting off learning for so long? And, what if we could finally cross off those skills that we've always wanted to learn but haven't had the opportunity to do so because of a lack of available time? According to a large number of people, it is possible to carry out these actions in the real world. Ultra-learners are a group of people who place a high value on self-education and academic excellence, and they have developed a whole culture around them. In other words, what exactly is ultra-learning? It's an intensive and rigorous strategy in which we commit to a goal and decide to undergo concentrated and focused learning in order to achieve that goal. Once we have made the decision to learn a skill, we set a time limit for ourselves and then dive into intense, focused work to expedite the process of learning. As an illustration, our author and a friend decided to travel to Spain with one condition, they were not allowed to speak English during their three-month stay. There are no exceptions. Young struggled at first but after three months, he was able to hold a conversation in Spanish with confidence. After that, the two friends traveled to three more countries, all of which followed the same language rule protocol. By the end of the year, they may be able to hold conversations in Portuguese, Mandarin, and Korean as well as English. An example of ultra-learning in action, this process demonstrates how to be self-directed and intensive while learning new skills. If we take a look at how we have traditionally learned languages through formal classroom instruction, we can see how drastically different the approach is today. Classroom instruction is frequently prescriptive and does not allow for much student agency. However, the process of ultra-learning requires us to take charge and create a path to knowledge that will be beneficial in real-world situations. Ultra-learning is based on nine fundamental principles or strategies. Principle 1, Meta-Learning, Create a Roadmap for Your Learning. Every journey begins with a roadmap that shows how to get there from where you are. Meta-learning, on the other hand, is the process by which we scaffold our learning journey and gain a comprehensive understanding. Many of us may be tempted to just dive right in and start learning, but having a plan will help us navigate our way through the process more effectively. We begin by considering why we want to learn something, then determine what constitutes success for us, and finally devise a strategy for achieving our goal. We frequently avoid planning because we consider it to be a time waster, however, 
Planning or meta-learning should account for 10% of the overall process. The reasons we want to learn can be categorized as either enjoyable or beneficial to our progress. Intrinsic learning is based on pleasure, and it is motivated by the desire to learn for its own sake rather than for the benefit of our careers. We are not attached to the necessity of the skill for our careers. The term instrumental learning refers to learning skills that will help us advance in our careers, and acquiring the skill will result in a tangible outcome, such as being promoted or getting a new job. We must focus our efforts on making the learning much more specific once we have determined why we want to learn something. I want to learn French, you may think, but this is often a vague and intimidating goal to set for yourself. Look at how Scott Young approached learning new languages. He set himself a goal of having 15-minute conversations with each person he met along the way. So, in order to assist you, break down your goal or project into concepts, facts, and procedures. Concepts are the ideas that we need to comprehend. Facts are the facts that we need to memorize, and procedures are the things that we learn through practice. Knowing what we need to learn gives us clarity and a sense of direction in our learning process. Then there's the question of how. How are we going to approach the learning process? Benchmarking can be useful in this situation. Benchmarking is a method of identifying common learning methods that can be used to kickstart a project. The idea is to make lists and do research on how to get started on your project and establish a benchmark for success. Then you go over your benchmarks and decide whether to emphasize or exclude specific resources based on their relevance. By consulting with experts, you can improve the effectiveness of your benchmarking. In a nutshell, meta-learning provides a roadmap and forces us to concentrate on the important things. The second principle is concentration. We will not be able to learn effectively unless we engage in intense concentration. There are three things that keep us from engaging fully when it comes to ultra-concentration. Procrastination, distraction, and poor optimization are the three areas in which we should be concentrating our attention. As we learned from Cal Newport's deep work, one of the most powerful tools we have is the ability to concentrate. Because distractions are costly, we can reduce our working time by increasing our level of concentration. The good news is that we can learn to focus and concentrate by practicing these skills. Do you have trouble getting yourself to sit down and get to work? Alternatively, if this sounds familiar, you could institute a warm-up ritual. It could be as simple as making a cup of coffee, going to the bathroom, and then turning off your phone. Whatever ritual you choose, it will put you in a productive frame of mind. Once you've taken a seat, set a timer for 15 minutes. Start with the 3-minute rule to get things started. Set a timer for 3 minutes and make a commitment to continue working throughout. This may appear to be a short period of time, but it generates significant momentum. There's also the Pomodoro technique, which involves setting a timer for 20 minutes taking a 5-minute break, and then restarting the 20-minute timer again and again. Also important is to optimize our concentration so that we can maintain it. It is important to consider both our inner and outer environments. Find a work environment that is conducive to productive work, for example. Consider decluttering and clearing the workspace of any distracting items to make our workspace more functional. Taking the temperature of our emotions and mental arousal are also important considerations. Some types of work necessitate high levels of alertness, while others can be completed with less alertness. The ability to concentrate and maintain focus can be learned, but it takes time and effort. The wonderful thing is that, once we've established good concentration habits, we can use technology to optimize our performance and free up more time. Principle 3, Directness, Put Yourself Into Action Mode Right Away. Frequently, we are instructed to go directly to the source. The same principle holds true for abilities. When we practice a skill in the environment in which we will eventually learn it, we learn it more effectively. This is in direct opposition to the concept of traditional classroom learning. To accomplish this, we must place a strong emphasis on immersion and simulation. We must be proactive in our learning and apply our new skills as soon as we can after we have acquired them. Make learning in the real world the primary focus whenever possible. Immersing ourselves in a situation allows us to think quickly on our feet and determine whether we will sink or swim. When it comes to learning languages, this method is extremely effective. We can also use simulation as a technique in situations where immersion isn't possible. This is the stage at which we simulate real-life situations. The concept behind this is that we want to create a situation that is as close to reality as we can. Examples include having a conversation with a friend in a foreign language or simulating a quiz show environment to gain a better understanding of the world around you. Direct exposure is the quickest and most efficient method of converting something theoretical into something useful in real life. To learn to cook properly, the best way is simply to get into the kitchen and start cooking. Similarly, if you want to learn to code properly, 
Project-based learning or a learn-by-doing mentality are the best ways to go about it. Drill, target weak points is the fourth principle. In order to improve anything, we must first recognize our own shortcomings. The drilling process is all about zeroing in on your weaknesses and putting your energy into improving them. What we choose to focus on as weaknesses has an impact on our overall proficiency, which helps us to unblock a lot of our learning opportunities. We can see that drilling is used by every successful ultra learner if we look at their work. Athletes at the top of their games, computer whizzes, musicians, and artists all perfect their craft by focusing on the aspects of it that they find the most difficult to master. Drills are the polar opposite of the preceding principle, which is straightforwardness. They assist us in improving a small slice of a skill while removing all of the subtleties of the real world that we are unable to simulate. The direct drilling process is a method of enhancing weak points rather than completely replacing your project. Using directness to overcome lack of transfer, work directly on the problem and drill your weak points, then returning to directness and cycling through the process as needed, retaining all of the valuable transfer. So, how do we go about creating our drills? We can employ time slicing, in which we repeatedly concentrate on a specific segment of time. For example, when learning an instrument, we might find ourselves repeating specific scales or parts of a song that we aren't yet proficient in performing. It all comes down to isolating specific steps in a process and repeating them until they are perfected. There's also the copycat method, in which we compare and contrast what we're doing with what other experts are doing in a similar situation. Principle 5, Retrieval, Put Your Knowledge to the Test. If you don't have the ability to retrieve information, knowledge is worthless. Memory access and recording are essential for us to be able to store and retrieve information from the computer. Recall is a direct method of learning in which we assess our ability to retrieve information by asking ourselves questions and then answering them. Recall is concerned with the short term, and it is important because we must retain whatever information we have learned. And passively reading and rereading the text isn't the most effective way to learn and retain information. In fact, according to a 2011 study conducted by Purdue University, the majority of students prefer the review process to recall. However, when it comes to effectiveness, memory outperforms reviewing when it comes to long-term knowledge retention and retention. So, why do we choose a less effective learning method in the first place? It all comes down to a matter of psychology. When we are engaged in learning, we use a process known as judgment of learning to guide us through the process. After reading something and thinking to yourself, I've got that, how often do you find yourself completely forgetting what you've read? We frequently believe that we know something because we have the impression that we have fully grasped the concept. This is a fallacy. And, as we all know, perception is not the only factor. Surprisingly, struggle is a necessary part of the learning process in many cases. The likelihood of remembering something in the long run increases when something is more difficult to learn in the first place. Desirable difficulty is the term used to describe this situation. The good news is that we can improve or recall skills by putting effective learning techniques into practice. Flashcards are a great tool for self-testing and for remembering information, as well as for learning new information. There's also the method of writing down everything you remember from a text, which is called the paraphrase method. Writing down everything you can remember after you've finished reading will allow you to retain as much information as possible. Finally, instead of taking notes, try to write questions. For example, when learning about World War II, Instead of asking when did World War II come to an end? Ask what year did World War II come to an end? Following our successful mastery of retrieval strategies, it's time to establish a positive relationship with feedback. Feedback, learn from criticism is the sixth principle. The difference between learners and ultra learners is that ultra learners actively seek out intense feedback in order to learn faster. The advice of Jung is to don't dodge the punches, to put your ego aside and look for feedback that gets straight to the point on what we are doing incorrectly and how we can improve. Take care, though, because not all feedback is created equal. It all boils down to providing constructive criticism. The least valuable feedback is the one that appeals to one's own sense of self-importance. After a performance, for example, there might be a round of applause. The most beneficial type of feedback is corrective feedback. This tells us exactly what we're doing incorrectly and how to correct it which is extremely helpful. If we want to make progress, we must learn to distinguish between the various types of feedback that we receive. A total of three types of feedback exist, outcome feedback, information feedback, and corrective feedback, also known as corrective feedback. The most fundamental type of feedback is outcome feedback, which is based on whether or not we have achieved our desired outcome. Our performance has been recognized with a round of applause, 
but we are unable to determine whether our performance has been better or worse than our previous performance because of the lack of quantitative data. It is more constructive to receive information feedback because it alerts us to the possibility that we may be making mistakes. We are alerted to the fact that there is a problem, even if we are not given specific instructions on how to resolve it. For example, when people walk out of a concert or a performance, corrective feedback is the most effective type of feedback. Not only are we informed that something is wrong, but we are also provided with suggestions for how to correct the problem. When we hand in a paper and receive a grade and a comment on it, this is a common type of feedback that we receive. As we learned from Seth Godin's book The Practice, we need to be able to elicit feedback and ask for corrective feedback in order to improve our effectiveness. Principle 7. Retention. Develop the ability to recall information. The ability to retrieve information over a long period of time is referred to as retention. Nigel Richards, an ultra-learner, is a prime example of the power of retention at its most extreme. Nigel Richards took home the title of World French Scrabble Champion in 2016. The only problem was that he couldn't communicate in French. What was his secret to accomplishing this? It all came down to a matter of memory. There are 386,000 French words that have been approved for use in Scrabble, and Richards has memorized each and every one of them. Remember that you are not alone if you find it difficult to recall even the most basic grocery list, let alone over 300,000 words in a foreign language. Young reminds us that forgetting is the default mode of the brain. Ebbinghaus's forgetting curve is the concept that our ability to recall information diminishes over time. Without interacting with what we've learned, we're more likely to forget what we learned. This explains why many of us have little or no recollection of what we learned in 8th grade. To retain information, we must be actively engaged with it on a conscious level. So, how do we get things to stick, and how do we keep things from sticking? First and foremost, we can use the strategy of spacing. This is a method of memorizing content while also putting it to use on a regular basis in stages that are closely spaced. This will take some getting used to for those who are used to cramming information into their heads at the last minute. Essentially, the idea is to disseminate knowledge and practice. When creating a learning program, make sure to space out your sessions as much as possible. Appropriately spaced, consistent spacing allows us to have enough time to retrieve information before it becomes difficult, but not so difficult that we can't get our hands on it at all. Make time for memorization at least a couple of times per week, if possible. If you're embarking on a practical task, the most effective way to remember it is to actually carry it out on your own. Over time, you'll notice that your body begins to operate on autopilot. Overlearning is a technique for retaining information, and we can see it in action when we drive a car, where driving becomes second nature after a certain amount of time. We can also try to remember things by creating mental pictures or using mnemonics to help us remember them. The most important thing is that we do everything we can to ensure that we retain what we have learned. Developing a deep understanding of intuition is the eighth principle. The intuitive and detailed understanding of the ideas and principles of their field that ultra-learners have is what distinguishes them as experts. Richard Feynman, a physicist, was renowned for his uncanny ability to predict the future. Feynman had the ability to see through complex problems and find a solution. Known technically as intuitive expertise, this ability can be difficult for people to define. It is difficult to describe in words. Feynman's brilliance, on the other hand, can be attributed to his in-depth understanding and knowledge of physics. Because of his expertise, he was able to predict things that others might not have predicted. For many of us, the thought of asking something stupid in class was terrifying. Understanding, on the other hand, is the first step toward becoming an intuitive expert. Feynman would quiz his students on a variety of so-called stupid questions, which they would find increasingly frustrating as the semester progressed. The premise behind this was that we must develop our understanding of fundamental concepts in order to become intuitive experts, and that we can only achieve this by first understanding their fundamentals. It is possible to develop intuitive understanding in three ways. We must struggle, aim to prove, and finally prioritize concrete examples in order to be successful. Many of us are looking for ways to speed up the learning process. This is the wrong way to go about things. We should be taking the path of least resistance, which will allow us to gain a better understanding of what we're trying to understand. Then we must set a goal for ourselves in order to prove something. This implies having a thorough understanding of how something works and being able to explain it thoroughly. We frequently believe that we understand something when, in reality, we only have a superficial grasp of the subject matter. Last but not least. Look for concrete examples. This is due to the fact that when there is an example to help explain something, the brain understands it more tangibly. For the most part, 
The most successful learners do not simply apply skills without understanding how they work. Experimentation. Principle 9. Step outside of your comfort zone. Proficiency is more than just mastery of a subject. Another characteristic of an ultra learner is their ability to be creative. We cannot, however, be creative and original unless we engage in some form of experimentation. There are three strategies that can assist us in moving beyond mastery and onto the path of originality. We can first copy something and then recreate it. This is the method that we use when we are cooking. We start by reproducing a recipe, and then, with practice, we gain confidence and the skills and imagination to move beyond the confines of a recipe book. We can also experiment by imposing restrictions on ourselves. For example, we could set a month-long restriction on ourselves by only cooking vegetarian food. Working within constraints forces us to break free from old habits and concentrate our efforts on trying something new. Finally, we have the ability to combine skill sets. Why not combine the things you're good at in novel and imaginative ways to make something new and exciting? Ultra learning frequently entails taking exploratory risks in order to discover new or better ways to achieve our objectives. Finally, I'd like to say. Here's a quick quiz to see how well you know yourself. Are you able to recall the nine guiding principles? Being an ultra learner is not easy, it entails a lot of effort. Scott Young, on the other hand, explains why and how to do it in order to assist us in getting our DIY learning adventure off to a good start and keeping it on track. And, if you aren't sure what your ultra learning project will be yet, why not start by reading this book and applying the principles contained within it to learn how to be an ultra learner? When James Clear and Barbara Oakley recommend your book, you can rest assured that you're in good company. Ultra Learning shares some information with Atomic Habits and Learning How to Learn, but it stands on its own with valuable self-study strategies taught in the nine universal principles of ultra learning. Ultra Learning is a subset of Atomic Habits and Learning How to Learn. So, are you prepared to take your learning to the next level and become an ultra learner? Thank you for listening in Audiobook Academy. Please don't forget to subscribe for more content like this. See you in next audiobook.